surgery. I think his abilities far surpass most of the surgeons that currently perform this type of work. And of course, seen here is with his mentor, Paul Tessier, while performing uh, some surgery in Cuba. If we look at the ancient history of tissue transplantation, it's quite interesting that the first depiction is an oil canvas, 16th century, where they depict St. Uh, Comas and Damian performing a lower limb transplant from an Ethiopian slave to Justinian. They could have picked any organ. It could have been the heart, it could have been the lungs, the kidney, but it's interesting that they chose probably one of the more difficult tissues, which involves skin. As Dr. Wolf noted, the first successful kidney transplant was performed by Joe Murray at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in 1954, and for that, he won the Nobel Prize. At that time, he wanted to pursue tissue transplantation, transplantation of skin, and the chairman of surgery felt that that was not the right pursuit for science and the possibility of transplanting skin would never be seen. If we look at what's going on historically, so from today's time, a total of 25 face transplants have been performed throughout the world. A variety of different types of face transplants have been performed from portions of the upper face, middle face, lower face. Some have included bones of the mandible, of the maxilla, portions of teeth, maybe a portion of a tongue, and different types of elements. It is universally understood that all patients develop some form of acute rejection episodes. And patients have been transplanted for a variety of different etiologies. Most have been traumatic, some have been oncologic, and for congenital disorders. So despite 25 face transplants that have occurred throughout the world, and we recognize that it is now technically feasible, ethically feasible, and immunologically feasible, is it still considered research? And likely the answer is yes, because it's still not standard of care. As we move on to this burgeoning field, and I show you several examples of patients that have received transplants throughout the world, we wonder if we're doing the right thing. There are a lot of challenging realities for all these patients. We have to understand the psychological nature. We have to understand what are the true aesthetic and functional outcomes that we can achieve. What are the societal impact of what we will be performing? And we have to ensure that the results are as best as we can provide, not only from an appearance standpoint, but also from a functional standpoint. So I've tried to break it down in a manner that I can understand it and that can help you understand it. And these are the key elements that are required to really be part of a phase transplantation program. And I've broken it down into clinical, research, obviously funding, and then the IRB approval. Since it is research, all institutions currently need institutional review board approval. You cannot achieve IRB approval without funding, and our current protocol is a research-funded protocol. So I'd like to begin with the clinical program. I come from a very busy trauma center in Baltimore, Maryland, which by today's standards sees about 10,000 trauma admissions a year. It's a busy place, and I've been fortunate to be mentored by a gentleman by the name of Paul Manson who really pioneered early treatment of facial injury. And the whole purpose of treating these patients early was to avoid soft tissue contracture. And he understood that if we align the skeleton in the proper position, the soft tissues should hopefully follow that normal architecture. And patients can convalesce quicker. And it doesn't matter the level of complexity or level of demolition of the underlying skeletal deformity. If we can precisely place those tissues and bony elements in normal position, the soft tissue drape should follow, and we should be able to align the tissues within the eyelids, make sure we get the proper projection of the nose, and hopefully these patients will respond normally. Or even more complex injuries, as seen in this young lady with a Lefort three fracture involving the orbits. And fortunate for her, she has no soft tissue deformity. The only thing that you're able to see is some soft stigmata from the asphalt hitting her face when she hit the ground. The more challenging problems are the high energy ballistic injury. These are the patients that are missing all the elements which include bone, mucosa, teeth, overlying skin, muscles. And in these patients, when you first evaluate them, the amount of skeletal demolition can be quite uh, overwhelming. But the same basic principles still arrive. We treat these patients early, we stabilize the bony elements, stabilize the occlusion, ensure that we preserve the normal high
point with a projection of the face. And a lot of these patients will require microvascular tissue transfer. But the goal is to get these patients back to our clinics during their first operative, post-operative visit looking relatively normal. And we know that this patient will require some additional surgeries. And even in patients that have sustained soft tissue loss, as seen here from a dog bite, most of the tissues are here. She is missing a large amount of lining from the upper lip. That we can treat with a microvascular tissue transfer, in this case taken from her arm. And the goal is to make her appear normal. So we have the abilities to really take patients to the highest level that we possibly can with conventional measures, but also with the high standards of surgical training. I think what's really helped uh, treat these types of results with excellence has been the inclusion of microvascular tissue. And in today's state of the art, the goal is to perform perforator-based flaps, where we try to minimize the damage to the surrounding tissues, and we take only those tissues that we truly need. And here's one young gal, she was 15 years old with progressive hemifacial atrophy. You can see that she has an underlying skeletal deformity. The family does not want to pursue skeletal surgery. So we have to find ways to chemicalize this problem. So we outline the area that needs to be addressed. We determine the tissue flap that we'll use. In this case, we'll take that from the thigh. The area will be exposed. We will transfer tissue from the leg to the face. We will slowly start reshaping that tissue until we can achieve some sense of normalcy without damaging the underlying facial musculature or the facial nerve. These are simple problems for us to solve, even in the pediatric population. The real problems arise when we're missing overlying skin, when we're missing bones, or we're missing portions of our facial uh, morphology that have not developed. And we'll talk about those principles. But I think in today's day and age, in order to achieve the results of the high standards, it involves combination of essentially three principles. Aesthetic principles, craniofacial surgical principles, and finally, microvascular surgery. So I'd like to begin talking to you about the existing clinical need, which I'm going to define as phase one. There is a clinical opportunity in the phase one that we see in the civilian injury, and one that we see in wartime injury. And we, if we look at the number of injuries that in our hometown in Baltimore, about 15% of the patients have some type of facial injury. In Iraq and Afghanistan, approximately 30% of the patients have had some form of devastating facial injury. And all this is the result of the improvised explosive device. A device has been created by terrorists to maim our soldiers. It doesn't kill them. It partially destroys them so that the platoon has to go out to save the soldier, and that's when our soldiers are in greater harm's way. And these are the types of injuries that our soldiers are suffering. We've been able to save their lives with protection of their torso. However, if we look at the number of casualties since the Korean War, when involving the face and limb amputation have gone up dramatically. Their face continues to be exposed, and from the IED blast is the area that is commonly injured. And these are the types of injuries that we're seeing and the type of patients that we're having to deal with. Despite everything that we've learned, despite all conventional surgery, despite advances in plastic surgery, there are significant limitations of what we can do for today's injured soldier. A lot of these patients also have concomitant injuries, which means their limbs or their arms, their legs may be damaged from where we need to take tissues to restore them. And even if we take those tissues, we can never make them look normal. If you look at the patient on the far right, he has had multiple operations by a very talented group, but that is the best that we can achieve with today's standards. So when we're missing the lips from the central facial injury, it's a very difficult area to treat. Another difficult problem is the total face, scalp, neck burn. These are difficult problems to treat, where a lot of these patients' tissues are already compromised. There is no way with our abilities that we can make these patients look normal. Or another challenging problem is seeing this congenital uh, deformity of a young gal with mandibular agenesis. There is no evidence of a mandible, therefore her tongue did not develop. She does not have a normal swallowing mechanism. She's trach-dependent and she's pet-dependent. 
And she was treated by a very good plastic surgeon in craniofacial surgery in Monroe, who performed rib grafts, and that's the best sense of a mandible that we can identify. The concern is that she's fractured the ribs, and now where do we go? But should she be a candidate for facial transplantation? Obviously, we can transfer a segment of a face, but we really have no nerves to connect to. We don't have nerves for normal tongue function. We don't have nerves for normal swallowing. She'll probably still be trach dependent and pec dependent. So I would say that this is probably not the type of patient we should pursue. However, the operation must always be proportionate to the problem. And in the words of Sir Harold Gillies, we must always try to replace like with like. But what can we do with some of these patients if we don't have that tissue to replace like? And as Plato said, necessity is the mother of invention. And it was the heroism of Bernard de Michel and Jean Michel de Bernard in 2005 where they performed the first face transplant in Isabel de Noir. And you can see the remarkable result that they were able to achieve with one operation. And in my hands, that would have taken 30 to achieve a low to suboptimal result. Or if you look at this young man, Pascal, also treated in France by a surgeon that recently passed away, Daniel Marchat. He has no fibromatosis. And you can see the severe deformity of this young man at the age of 30. Without a face transplant, this individual would not have been able to have been integrated into society. He currently has a full-time job, has his own apartment, and has a significant other. It would not have been possible if he looked like he did in the middle picture. However, there is one true reality. When you move on the spectrum, you are dependent on lifelong immune suppression. Forever you will need to take medication. So this is not just a technical operation. It is an ethical operation where we have to understand that these patients forever will be on medication, which can potentially compromise organs. And that's why we felt as a unit that it was critical that we have a solid foundation in research. And our research is primarily based on the non-humate primate model, a model that we felt would be critical for the longevity of our program. We spent 10 years performing research on non-human primates, the only phrase transplant model of its kind. And all of the efforts have been worthwhile. And what we've learned is that the inclusion of vascularized bone actually provides longevity of graft survival and allows us to diminish the amount of immune suppression that these animals require. What we've also learned when we transplant from an adult to a younger uh, primate those grafts also survive longer. So there is the possibility for easier and earlier integration in a younger patient. Now this material has been published in probably the most reputable scientific journals throughout the world, and the value of the vascularized bone is understood throughout the scientific arena. Our support has come from the Department of Defense Office, Office of Naval Research. They've supported us with $13 million, completely dedicated to this project. And with these monies, we were able also to pursue the clinical transplant, which we'll talk about shortly. But the ultimate goal in immune suppressive action is to try to limit or control the T cell cascade. And there are many mechanisms where we can do this by. And in today's day and age of medications, the medicines are absolutely remarkable. And there are ways that we can prolong and eliminate some of these acute rejection episodes that we've seen. However, these medications all come with a price. They can potentially damage organs which are important for the quantity of our life, kidneys. They can create malignancies, cutaneous malignancies, which we see in a lot of these patients. In addition, we have to protect these patients for potential um, infectious episodes that may acquire under the use of pressive medications. So they require prophylaxis, which is standard for all patients that are willing subjects.